Mr. Ben. Hebrews chapter 12, and verses 1 through 4. Read through them again. And we'll take our text out of there for this evening. Hebrews 12, 1 through 4, and the Word of God says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. Our Heavenly Father, again, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for the wherewithal. Thank you, Lord, for the many hands that were able to come and uh, take part, Lord, in the work today. Lord, we got a final accurate count of 1,739 gospel tracts, Lord, placed in the hands here in the city of Fitchburg, Lord, where you have put us to be a light in the darkness of this world. Lord, we pray that you be glorified by it. Lord, we pray that fruit will result from it. Bless, Lord, now the message. Lord, uh, I am weary, sore, and tired. It's been a busy day already. Lord, but I need to preach. I want to preach. I thank you for the privilege preaching. And so help me now, Father, to present, Lord, the message that you've given to me for this evening, Lord, for these your lambs. And I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah. Second half of verse 2 is our text this evening. It says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn over to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Down to verse 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're given in our text as well as the verses that we've just read here in Philippians. The very mentality that is expected of each and every one of us. The Lord, the eternal and all glorious word of God, laid that aside. He laid aside his deity and became a mortal man. A humble man. A lowly man. A 
a.k.a. an unpretentious man. He, the only begotten Son of God the Father, took on himself the form of a servant and presented himself for selfless service. He humbled himself. Don't ever pray, oh God, make me humble. God will humble you. Okay? You're a whole lot better off if you humble yourself. Humble yourself. You know, he did it. He did it willingly. He did it knowingly. God the Father did not have to humble Jesus Christ so that he would serve. He did it himself. There was no pride. There was no arrogance. There was nothing there that God had to... There wasn't a, 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 a selfish will that had to be broken and subdued and eradicated before the Lord Jesus Christ would serve. He became obedient by his own will and subjected himself to the will of God the Father. Jesus Christ had died to self long before he surrendered himself to the spiritual and mortal death of the cross. Both of which resulted in his now dead soul. Because he became a dead soul on the cross. He became sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And that spiritual and then mortal death resulted in his dead soul suffering in hell on our behalf. To pay the price for our sins. Okay. All these all that say, oh, you know, Christ paid for sins on the cross. Well, how did that happen? How did a mortal death pay the price of sin? Well, then everybody that goes through mortal death would be able to have, well, my sins are paid for. I went through mortal death. If that's the case, then, then, then why, then, when anybody dies, do they go to hell? Craziness, I'm telling you. Uh, he paid for our sins, not just on Calvary, but in Him. And then on the third day, He rose again from the dead through the power of God the Father, as He had been promised. I mean, the death on the cross could have no other result. Okay? You're cursed is anyone that hangeth on a tree. And as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, even so will I draw all men unto myself. Christ became sin. John 3, 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent, I just quoted that. Yeah. Lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What can live? Okay. He became that serpent. He became sin. That old red serpent, the devil, and Satan, as we're told in Revelation 12, 9. So that all sin, and I mean all sin, from that of Lucifer <coughs> to the very last offense before time has ended, and to the satisfaction, and, you know, I mean the complete satisfaction of the holiness and righteousness of God. Yes, Satan's sin has been paid for. Is he going to take advantage of it? Not according to this. Not that he could. Okay. The salvation that Christ wrought is not for the spirit realm. Not for them. But God has been satisfied. The price has been paid. It goes on and says, and for the joy that was set before him. Oh, uh, heard a lot.
lot of messages preached that talk about what Christ endured on the cross physically and spiritually and how horrible it was. I preached it myself. But here it says that for the joy that was set before him, the joy of obedience, the joy of knowing that he was fulfilling the predetermined and desired will of the Godhead. This is something that he and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit had devised as a plan, a means of salvation for all humanity while he was still deity, before anything was ever created. And then he said, and I'll be the one to fulfill it. For the joy of becoming the promised and prophesied woman seed, the Christ of God, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, the Savior and Redeemer of men, the conqueror of the destroyer, the devil, and the eternal victor over death and hell. And joy. <laughs> oh, what a horrible thing. The joy. Joy. I mean, how's that for a resume? <laughs> Can you give us a resume of your qualifications? <laughs> yeah, for the joy of the knowledge that he knew that he would rise from the dead after the third day and would accomplish completely all that had been determined. It was done. Mankind had a means of salvation that even we couldn't mess up. That's why you've got no part in it. It's been completed by God. And for the joy of the knowledge that which had not yet been fully revealed, but would be openly declared after his ascension. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the seven mysteries of the New Testament church. God had been manifested in the flesh. Christ would be in us, the hope of glory. The church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ, the final and full redemption of the nation of Israel. Okay? God doesn't make promises he doesn't keep. The revelation of mystery Babylon. The mystery of iniquity that already at work in the world at Christ's time and has been working steadily ceaselessly, tirelessly for the last 2,000 years in preparation for bringing the Antichrist to power. If you don't believe so, you should have been out there on Main Street today for three hours and seen the stuff that walked by. And then, of course, the blessed hope of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ returning to take the church out and take us home in preparation for us returning with him when he comes to claim what's his. He endured the cross. Go back to Hebrews, but let's go to Hebrews 13, the very next chapter, and pick it up at verse 10. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 10 down to 14. <coughs> We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. 
Hey, if you, again, if you were out there Main Street or have been there any other time when we've been doing these kinds of programs, you know, okay, by the response we get from some, that we bear the reproach of cross and do it with joy. Be glad to, that you are despised for his sake. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, we do. This world's got nothing that I want. I'll be so glad <laughs> to leave it behind. But somewhere up in the far north, get outside this galaxy, enter into the third heaven. There's a city under construction being built by the Lord himself. Inside that great city, the new Jerusalem, is your mansion that you've been promised. Can't even begin to grasp the size, never mind the grandeur. I mean, the size of this thing, 15 100 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles high. <laughs> if you set it down on the face of the planet Earth, it would run from Washington, D.C. down to Miami, Florida, from Miami, Florida, uh, out to uh, Colorado. I can't remember which city, but then again going up north into, into Montreal and Canada. I mean, this thing's huge. It's almost, just its footprint is almost as big as the continent of Australia. And it's as wide as it is long, and it's that high. I mean, you go 1,500 miles, okay, you're outside the atmosphere. <laughs> you're you're going to have satellites going, I mean, so how big is my mansion? <laughs> Not that I need that. God preparing those things for us just simply because he loves us and wants us to have those things. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, I love that he put that in there, your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The physical, mortal death on the cross did not give our Lord one moment's pause that he might shrink back from it, from its suffering and pain. He could endure the shame. He could endure the shame. Artists, I'm sure, for a sense of decency, will have painted pictures of the crucifixion have him with cloth wrapped around his loins. That wasn't how it was. He hung there naked. Treated shamefully. All the world to see, to mock at him. He can endure the shame. He can endure the shame of becoming sin. The shame of becoming a curse in order to accomplish the Father's will. He was far capable of enduring those things, of being lifted up like a vile criminal before all the world, though he was innocent of any sin, innocent of any crime. He could endure that shame of Say, being hung naked for all the world to see. Most folks, they don't have any kind of shame about running around naked nearly so. Yeah.
should have been out on Main Street. <laughs> he was mocked, he was ridiculed by the lewd and the vulgar people that were there as his mortal flesh hung there, shuddering and shaking and straining against the wounds and the indignities that it was suffering. I mean, I'm not going to go into the whole thing of what occurs to a person in crucifixion. Okay. But while he was hanging up, he lost his bladder. He lost his bowels. Straining against the intense pain and the spasming of his muscles. Okay? And the pain in his organs. He's dehydrated. He can't breathe. He's got to pull himself up against those nails and push with his feet against those nails to get himself up so he can get air into his lungs and then find the pain and the straining's too much and he collapses again, can't breathe. That's what goes on through the whole process. The only thing, only one thing, had given the Lord Jesus Christ even one moment's pause in fulfilling the will of the Father, and that was because of the knowledge that when he became sin, and so died spiritually, and became a dead soul, as he hung there between heaven and earth, is that he would be separated from God the Father, and God the Son of a necessity, because he had become sin. Son separated away from God the Father. The Son separated from the Holy Spirit of God as he hung there in agony. That's the only thing that gave him any pause. And it wasn't while he was on the cross. It was while he was in Gethsemane the night before. Praying. Begging the Father. Not because he was afraid of anything else, but didn't want to be separated from God. Any way that this cup can pass from him, Lord, let thy will be done, not my will. I mean, to, to be in such an agony that it says that he literally sweat blood. You know, the strain the, 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 the agony and torment so great that blood vessels were bursting in his body and it was coming out through the pores of his skin. But the Lord endured it. He endured it. And knowing that through his obedience the will of God the Father would be accomplished and be glorified and that men would have the opportunity to have a salvation that had no dependency upon them but solely upon Him and what He was going to accomplish in the next three days him great joy. Endured the cross, despising the shame. And then number four, it says, and he is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He sat down. Folks usually sit down once a task is finished. Can't sit down. Task not going to get finished if you sit down. John 17, 5 says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. The Lord had finished his three and a half year ministry, presenting himself to Israel as their Messiah and <coughs> as their king. Excuse me. <coughs> And he was now ready to return 
and his glory in heaven. John 17 again. This time pick it up, verse 11. John 17, verse 11, down to 23. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word. The world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even so, or excuse me, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Christ had finished laying the foundations of the New Testament church. From here we need to go to Ephesians 2 once more. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 to 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19, to the end of the chapter. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ had laid the foundation, and the Apostle Paul, to whom the Lord gave those seven mysteries for the church, continued the structure, 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians Chapter 3. Doesn't sound right. <coughs> oh. Hang on here. I'm in 2 Corinthians, that's why. Helps if I get in the right place. Huh? 1 Corinthians 3. Pick it up to verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And every believer ever since has had their opportunity 
to add to the building of the church of Jesus Christ. Now the Lord is going to finish the work of conquering and vanquishing the unholy trinity. Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16. Well-known verses. Nice.